Hi, my name is Keegan Tawa, and today I'll be giving you an update on my software project, Pisces. Pisces stands for Procedural Iterative Stellar Evolution Simulation. It simulates the birth, growth, and development of a very small micro galaxy. If you're not familiar with the project, you can check out some of my previous videos about different areas of the software or my blog, superhedral.com. Today, I'll be talking about Pisces' new orbital system and how Pisces can now randomly generate realistic orbital hierarchies and geometries for multiple star solar systems. In unary solar systems like our own, which have only one sun, the orbital hierarchy is actually pretty simple. All of the planets orbit the sun, some of our planets have moons, and we even have one binary planet system, the pluto charon system, in which the planets are of similar mass so they orbit each other, sort of, We'll come back to that later. Generating a hierarchy for a unary solar system is pretty straightforward. Things start to get interesting though when we want to generate a hierarchy for binary star systems and beyond. When two bodies of a similar mass orbit each other, they're actually orbiting around something called a barycenter, which is their mutual shared center of mass. A system like this is called a two-body system. Every body in our solar system actually has a two-body relationship with the sun. It just so happens that the sun is so much more massive than planets like Earth, the Earth-Sun barycenter is inside the sun. So in an application like Pisces, it's not really worth modeling this two-body system. However, for massive planets like Jupiter, which are so large and so far away from the sun, the Jupiter-Sun barycenter actually lies outside the surface of the sun, which is pretty interesting. This is why Pluto and Charon are actually a binary planet system. They're close enough in mass that their barycenter is outside the surface of Pluto, unlike the Earth-Moon system, in which the Earth-Moon barycenter is very close to the center of the Earth. Now, in reality, all of the planets in our solar system and the Sun are all interacting gravitationally at all times. It's not really a nice, neat hierarchy of two-body problems, of course. It's much messier and sloshier than that, that we, as a species, absolutely lack the computational power to model explicitly. However, using a series of two-body systems, we can get extremely close to the way these gravitational systems actually do work. In any case, when we begin creating a hierarchy for a binary plus solar system, we begin with two stars in orbit around their mutual barycenter. If we were to add planets at this point, they could attach to either of the stellar bodies, or, less likely, they could actually attach to the barycenter. These two different types of planetary orbits are called S-type and P-type orbitals. When we add a third star to the solar system, that's when things start to get interesting. At this point, the solar system will either become a multiplex or a simplex system. In a multiplex system, all of the stars orbit around their shared center of mass. These systems tend to be extremely chaotic and unstable, for as all of the stars are moving, so is their center of mass. The stars can be in similar orbital regimes, causing them to interact, either forming binary pairs, devouring each other, or even yeeting each other right out of the solar system. In a simplex system, however, we get a much more stable set of cascading binary two-body problems. That is, when we add a third star to a binary system, it's going to pick one of the existing two stars and they are going to become a binary pair. That pair as a unit is going to behave as a single body as it interacts with the opposing star. The more and more stars we add, the more and more cascading sets of two-body systems we get. In our universe, most solar systems have two or more suns. And of these systems, most of them are simplex systems. This is because, over time, multiplex systems usually become simplex systems. When the stars of a multiplex system interact, they're either going to form binary pairs, or they're going to separate, forming two simplified, probably simplex, solar systems. For this reason, right now, Pisces only models simplex solar systems. Multiplex systems are far less common, and modeling an n-body gravitational interaction is extremely computationally and mathematically demanding. In a simplex system, all we have to do is model a cascading set of two body systems, and it turns out this is extremely accurate in comparison to how simplex systems work in reality. Before we move any further, you might be asking yourself, how Pisces even decides if there should be multiple stars in a solar system? And if so, what types should they be and how many planets should they have? The full answer exceeds the scope of this video, but the short answer is that there are two different ways that a multiple star solar system can form in Pisces. 
The first is co-formation. This is when two stars coalesce out of gas and dust at approximately the same place and same time, thus forming a multiple star solar system. The second method that a multiple star solar system can form is by interaction. Pisces simulates the movement of a galaxy across vast time scales of billions of years. During this time, stars are moving through their orbits around the galactic center, and if two stars ever wander into the same place and the same time, they have a chance to interact. When two stars interact, they are either going to form a multiple star solar system, or they could impact each other's orbits. This zoomed out galactic propagation system deserves a whole separate video of its own, which I will probably make at some point. But if you're interested in it, I do speak about it briefly in one of my previous videos. For now, let's zoom back in to the specific orbital hierarchies and geometries inside the multiple star solar system. Now that we finally have the abstract orbital hierarchy of our solar systems generated in the form of a binary tree, we need to actually ascribe elliptical geometry to all of the different stars and planets contained in these solar systems. What are the elliptical pathways and the positions and velocities of all of these celestial bodies? In order to figure this out, first we need to choose a standoff distance between the first two nodes in the orbital hierarchy and generate binary oppositional Keplerian orbital element sets for these two nodes. I say nodes here because we're not necessarily placing stars yet. We may be placing the barycenters about which two branches of this binary tree are centered. The masses of these nodes are actually the masses of all of the stars beneath them on the binary tree. This step involves a lot of math and geometry, which definitely escapes the scope of this video. But if you're interested, I go through every step in gruesome detail over on my blog, superhedral.com. From here, we install independent coordinate systems on each of these stars, called perifocal reference frames. Now at this point, it's simply a matter of repeating the process I just outlined over and over again, moving down the binary tree until we hit its bottom. At this point, we can finally attach all of the solar system's planetary bodies to their parent stars. When we're finally done, we've generated the elliptical positions and velocities of all of the stars and planets in the solar system, and we can finally put them into motion. It looks something like this. Here you can see a binary pair. On the left, an A-type star is in a binary orbit with a G-type star, which you can see on the right. You'll notice that the size of the A-type's orbit is much smaller because it's more massive and the barycenter is closer to the center of that star. Here we see a zoomed-in view of the G-type's planetary plane. Here you can see an example of a trinary solar system with three suns. The pair at the left, as a unit, is in a binary orbit with the star at the right. You can also see, interestingly, that the binary pair has a highly inclined plane of the ecliptic. Here you can see a gas giant with 34 moons. Its lunar plane is highly inclined. It's important to note in these videos that while the distances between these bodies are to scale, the actual radii of these celestial bodies have been heavily modified. In this video, the solar scaling is multiplied by 17, planetary scaling is multiplied by 350, and lunar scaling is multiplied by the planetary scaling times 600. The propagation speed is one month per second. In this video, you can see a quaternary star system with four suns. The binary pair at the right is engaged in a two-body system with the binary pair at the left. This brings us actually to a pretty exciting landmark in the development of Pisces. For the first time in the past couple of years that I've been working on this project, we finally have in place a full space to ground system. That is, you can start out in the galactic scope hundreds of light years away from a planet and zoom in continuously until you're only a few hundred feet above the planet's surface. Even though all of the visual detail of the planets is not rendered yet, the fact remains that finally the full space to ground system is in place. So I'm going to stop talking and take the software from a drive from the outer rim of an alien galaxy to the surface of another world.
I hope you enjoyed this update on Pisces. If you want more regular and detailed updates on the software, please subscribe to my blog, superhedral.com. Thank you for watching.